I, I want to talk about something I enjoy. So we'll start the week off right. We're talking about aeromedical factors today. Why does this stuff matter to us? Nope. That's not why. <laughs> I mean, it is, but honestly, there's only a couple things on there that are in the ranks. Why do we care about aeromedical factors, though, as pilots? What, how is this going to, what's the deal? The whole thing that you don't think are a problem can snowball into a problem. Ken? Do you just pull over the side of the road if you get tired of the airplane? Yeah, no. So we need to make sure it's a little bit different than driving a car. You can't just go out there and just, you know what? It's great, we're going. You gotta have there has to be a little bit more planning involved with flying an airplane because they're we're accepting so much more risk. Okay. So we're gonna talk about fitness for flight and then hyperventilation, hypoxia, carbon monoxide poisoning to a point. Illusions in flight and aeronautical decision making. All right. How do we determine our fitness for flight? I'm safe. Okay. What's I'm safe? Uh, Not define it. What is it? I don't want to know what each and individual one is. I want to know what I'm safe is. It's a checklist for the basics to make sure that you're good to go. Who? You as pilot. Is that it? And co-pilot. Is that it? And passengers too, I guess. Good. You're thinking. When we talk about it, you'll see to explain why. That doesn't just apply to us as pilots. If you do it, obviously, as a pilot, a pilot in command, or if you have a second in command, but also your passengers can fall under this, okay? It is a understanding model, all right? It's part of aeronautical decision making. What's another, how else can we determine fitness for flight? Is it just us? The plane. The plane. You gotta make sure the plane's fit for flight, right? Well, what's that called? Airworthiness. Airworthiness. Exactly. So if we, she said plane, or you said pilot, aircraft, P, A, does anybody know the rest of this? Oh. Huh? It's PACE, right? Mm -hmm. PAVE. PAVE. Yeah. P -A -V -E, pilot, P -I -C, um, aircraft, environment, and doesn't matter, we're going to get to it here in a sec. It's actually right up there. <laughs> External pressures. Okay, we're going to talk about each individual one of these. All right, here's some of your air, your um, risk management models. You've got the pay, the I'm safe, the five P's, the three P's. When you guys go into check ride, the DP is going to want to know that you know something about a model. You can talk about it. it's part of your process. All right, five P's: plan, train, pilot, passengers, and programming. Does anybody? Obviously, the plan. What's the plan? To, uh, dealing with. Yeah, what are you going to do in the airplane? Are you going on a training flight? Are you going on a cross country? Are you going sightseeing? You no, know, you need to determine how this is going to affect you and what goes in, what's involved in it. All right, do you need to do a flight plan? Are you going to file? You're just going out to the practice area. What about today? How about your plan today? How are we going out to the practice area today? Change from a day that's kind of nasty and bumpy. Any other ideas? Yeah, traffic. How busy do you think it was out there today? Those of you who are not in here earlier, or those of you that were in here earlier, fish. How busy do you guys think it was today? It's beautiful, right? It was super smooth in practice here. There's no bumps. How many people are out there? Pretty much everybody that could fly today was flying. How insane do you think that practice area is? What is the problem? with going out to the practice area right now. What altitudes are we flying in? All the same. We're all doing ground reference maneuvers, or, and we're staying below 2,500 feet out in the practice area the whole time. Well, you want to stay above 1,000 feet typically because you want to get too close to the ground. That's 1,500 feet. You're starting to get close proximity to people. We're doing emergency procedures like deep spirals, or we're doing um, emergency engine failures. We're gliding. We're just you know, there's a lot of things happening. Chandelles, where you're doing a power, but you're doing a maximum performance climbing turn. You know, we're changing altitude a lot out there sometimes. Doing 300, uh, steep turns, so 360 degree steep turns. You know, just there's a lot going on. Plus, you have people transiting the area. Okay? 
So, aircraft, I'm sorry, uh, the plane, obviously the pilot, passengers, and then programming. What's programming? Avionics in the airplane. Do you know how to use it? Okay. These are just models for you guys to use. Do you have to use these four? No. No. You just need to use one or two of them that, so that the examiner knows you understand risk management and how this and how these models help us. We use these here every way. Okay, the PAVE and the I'm safe. How does the I'm safe relate to the PAVE? So the first section knows the pilot. Says, pilot. That pilot. Oh, I'm safe. Aircraft, airworthiness. Okay. This is how these work together. All right, here's your I'm safe. Illness. Medication, stress, alcohol, and fatigue. Who has seen a different one? This wasn't always. Oops. I gotta fix that real fast. Um, emotion. I'm sorry, man. I was clearly thinking about a different thing. It used to be. In uh, the pilot handbook, aeronautical knowledge, it used to be eating. Dame has always called it eating. Dame has always called it emotion. All right. So we're going to talk about each one of these because this is a big deal for us for fitness of flight, okay? We'll get into that. Yes. So what kind of illnesses might prevent us from flying? Let's talk about, like, Physical illness. And the mental would go with something else. We'll talk about that in a second, okay? Anything to do with sciences. Why? Because you're dealing with changes in air pressure. Okay. Hence why I have this up here. What else? I mean, that's good. You're looking at the less obvious ones, like how about a head cold? Can you just take medication and go fly, right? No. no. Why not? Oh, well, no. Is. You have to be careful with the medications you take. I mean, if it's if you can buy it from the store, you, you're good to go, right? It's not been prescribed to you. Why not? Because you can buy some pretty head suit from the store. <laughs> 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 yeah. What's another one that a lot of people they is actually? What do you think is one of the worst ones? Robitussin's bad. Uh, not Robitussin, but uh, Nyquil is very bad. They don't like you on Nyquil. Which one? Benadryl. Benadryl. Yeah. Antihistamines. Um, if I remember right, it is 60 hours, I think. It's either 60 or 72 <laughs> hours before you can go fly again if you've taken Benadryl. That's wild. Uh, NyQuil is 60 hours. That's why you can't walk around and fly a plane. That's strong. <laughs> Dude, I don't know about you guys. Like, everybody, drugs like this, they, this is, I mean, we're not talking like heavy drugs, right? This is just cold medicine. And for me, cold medicine, I can't, if I take it, I'm down for two days after taking it. Like the next day, I still feel a little bit. The day after that is when I'm finally starting to feel normal again. That stuff affects me differently. Big time. I don't know why. I am a lightweight, yeah. Um, but that's okay. I'm good with it. It gives me an excuse to have a couple days off of work. <laughs> um, but yeah, over the counters. Everybody knows if you're obviously, if you've got the flu, are you flying? I mean, you're not even no. getting out of bed. Um, and if you're on prescription medication like Flexeril or um, Percocet and things like that that are really going to knock you down, you're obviously, I can't, I mean, you're not even driving your car to go fly, you're, let alone fly the airplane. But see, over the counters that you have to be really, really careful of, the colds, the little things that get you, the sinus issues. Who remembers me talking about uh, how much it sucked to fly with an ear infection? Mm -hmm. That's an ear infection. Right here, sir, the ones. It, you know, one ear was plugged. That's not any big deal, right? Except I couldn't clear. And it just had pressure building up. And you do run the risk of what? Perforating an eardrum. That's very uncomfortable. Okay? So it's the little things like that. Should you go fly with a cold? Probably not. Who makes that call? You do. You do. That's why we have the I'm safe illness. Illness. Medication. What's the S? Does anybody remember? Stress. Stress. What are the two types of stress? Physical and mental. 
Mm. Oh, the book status. Okay. Acute and chronic. Long term chronic. What's the problem with chronic stress? Increased heart rate, hypertension. Okay. Uh, but those are all the physical manifestations of it. What is the problem? Like acute stress. If it's if it's oh acute or well no chronic, but what with acute stress? Like you can you can end acute stress. So with chronic stress, there's usually a long term thing that you can't really avoid. Yes, stress the job. Yeah. Living situation. Can you tell if you're suffering from chronic stress? Usually, it becomes a part of who you are. You just have a yeah. You've got financial stress and family stress, and say somebody in your family is dealing with some health issues, and it's just stress. You know, it is becoming just part of who you are. If you've been dealing with it for years, how do you know any different? Okay. But acute stress. So chronic. Equals bad. Acute, is that bad? Usually no. Not necessarily. Yes or no, it depends. And acute can become chronic if it is something you deal with that becomes starts to become part of your lifestyle and sticks around, okay? So stress is bad. I just said that chronic stress is really hard to tell. So how can you evaluate yourself for your stress levels? You probably get regular medical screenings. So you should <laughs> ask who has gone and gotten their medical already? Did they talk to you about stress? Yeah. Did they identify anything? Not really. Doc called me bad. That's it. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So he was hanging over his belt, so he got it. Yeah. <laughs> <Thanks>. um, <laughs> but with stress, yes, we go in for medicals. But again, it's no different than going to any other doctor. You have to identify that yourself. And if it is part of who you are, it is really tough to identify. Okay, so that is something when we identify that, think about okay, has anything new occurred that might be affecting me and should, and how can that, is there anything I can do to help relieve some of that stress? It's not easy though, okay? And as you get older and older and you have other things going on in your life, like kids and spouses and stuff like that, parents getting older and health deteriorating, your stress levels can really jump up. Now, you guys, I don't know who in here is paying for their own school, but. Financial stress is huge. So, okay. Alcohol. What does the FAA say about alcohol? Never drink. Don't go over. <laughs> over what? 0.04. Don't go over 0.04. Is he correct? I think it's 2 before you. No, it does not matter. Doesn't matter? I thought it was 20. Right. Just to click class. No, you said don't go over. Hey, you have to be below 0 0.04. Cannot be 0 0.04, it must be below. Point zero four or greater. Equal to and above, okay? So eight hours. What's this one mean? Maybe hung over. They hung over, so I warn you guys that as you get older, it sticks around longer. <laughs> well, even just a second, uh, when you have a concentration less than 0.04, you're under the influence of alcohol, though. But they're talking about maybe, maybe not, it's still breaking down in your system, and maybe you're not hung over at that point. You did a good job of hydrating, which I don't usually. Um, so it's possible to still have it and be legal if you're not feeling the effects of it. It's not affecting your um, judgment. But how do we know? I mean, probably will be hung over. So and that's the good thing. If that's, I mean, not the good thing, but that's the indicator to us is if you're hung over, you're probably still under the influence of it. You better not go. Okay. Say again. Liver passes is one standard drink of alcohol per hour. Yep. And then AIM talks about this extensively. Uh, this is directly out of the reg 91117 up here. And 8-1 um, gets into all of the fitness for flight stuff, the medical factors for pilots in the AIM, okay? All right. Uh, we're going to go back. We're going to finish up with this. 
the T. What's up? No, I was thinking of Reese with the four pack. Well, I wanted to, I was going to work back and forth on it. All right, so fatigue. Talk to me about fatigue real fast. What's that dealing with? Leg day, so you can't work the rudders. Say again? Like you had leg day, so you Possibly. Can't work. <laughs> Possibly. Yeah. It's not a problem for me. I don't go to the gym, obviously. What else? So, yeah, if you are uh, physically fatigued from the gym or from exercising, yeah, that could be a factor to consider. But what else? How, what else can affect fatigue? Say again? Sleep. Did you? Flight hours. What else? Sleep debt. Anybody else? Sleep after the insomnia. Okay, we're still on sleep. Besides sleep, I worked in general. I mean, you may have eight hours of sleep. A long work day. What else? Monotony. The same thing over and over again. Say again. Monotony. Okay. <laughs> What's that become? Complacency. Complacency. Yes. Good. Excellent. What else? Yeah. What? What if you haven't eaten all day? Oh. Are you going to be more susceptible to fatigue? Yeah. All right, so sleep and eating, what else? Hydration. hydration. How important do you think hydration is? Hydration is key. We're about to talk about something else here in a little bit. How do you think hydration affects that? Do you guys think that hydration might affect your susceptibility to hypoxia? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Okay. So don't get hung up on the word fatigue and thinking of one thing. It's a lot of stuff. Because what's missing on here? You don't see eating or drinking on here. You know? Yeah. If you're not taking care of yourself physically, you will be susceptible to fatigue. How about being overweight? More susceptible to fatigue? So as they want us to ask us to take care of ourselves. If any like my AME is always on my case for my blood pressure and making sure that I'm exercising regularly to take care of myself better because it makes us more susceptible to that. Okay? And emotion. Why is emotion on here? You don't want to be stressed out of point or mad at something. Well, what if you're driving into a fly, you're in a great mood, you woke up, Day like today is gorgeous. You're going to be able to do your uh, cross country down to home where you can't wait. You're going to go get a piece of pizza. That's awesome. And some Giacomo cuts you off and flips you off because they're dumb. Do you think that's going to affect you emotionally? Good. Or how about somebody rear ends you because they're just not paying attention to screwing around on their cell phone? Does that going to emotionally affect you or love? Or you find out that your grandmother just passed away. No. There's a lot of things. Can emotion change quickly? Yep. Can it change in flight? Yep. What's that? Oh, no. <laughs> so, emotion, what are some of the ones that can change in flight? Can illness change in flight? Yep. What about medication? Probably not. Drug? Probably not. <laughs> If you haven't taken it for already, I doubt you're going to take something in the plane. Dramamine is a no-go. All right. Passengers, it's okay. Not for us. Stress, can that change in flight? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, most definitely. Alcohol, I hope not. <laughs> and remember, eight hours, bottle throttle. So if you're drinking in flight, I think you're within that eight-hour block. All right. Fatigue? Yep. Most definitely. And emotion? Yep. For sure. Uh, I can tell you... If you have somebody not paying attention and buzz right through your practice area while you're trying to do a maneuver at a thousand feet and they get close to you, your motion might change. <laughs> I know mine does. Okay. All right. We discussed um, this a little bit and the medication is good. Alcohol. All right. Hyperventilation. What is the cause of hyperventilation? Well, what happens? What is what Hyper happens to, to intake the oxygen, right? imbalance? I don't know. Too much of what, oxygen. and not enough of what? Too much oxygen, not enough CO2. Bingo. 
which we need CO2, a little bit, too much oxygen will hyperventilate. We can't process it properly. So we do need a level of CO2 in our, uh, as we breathe. What are you told to do if you start hyperventilating? Breathe in a bag. Breathe into a bag. What else can you do? Say you're in flight. You don't have a bag in your, in your hands to do that. If like, so you're flying along, if you're passenger, we get hit by a really nice gust of wind and it rocks the plane all over the place and they start to hyperventilate. What do you do? Fires. <laughs> huh? You can, but you're going to want to get them to, well, breathe into a bag gets us to recycle some of that CO2, right? We've exhaled some of it, we're re inhaling. So it's, it's reduce the amount of oxygen that we have in our lungs, right? What's wrong? Oh, no, no, I just remember hearing from people that the whole breathe in the back and you're not supposed to do that anymore. Well, we, I mean, you can, but it's momentary. But there's something else you can do that's just as effective. Breathe in your hand or your shirt. Yeah, and then get them talking, like you said. Talking helps a lot, too. One, they're emotional. Talking calms people down. All right? Getting them to talk will help calm them down. Hey. It's no big deal. Talk to me through. Like, what did you, like? What are you worried about? Do you think the airplane's going to crash? Well, this and this that. As they talk, they'll stop hyperventilating. Okay. Well, what if you propose doing it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you were in the same situation at the same time. So. Well, if piles, I hope. I understand. Yeah, I mean, same thing. You need to know what to do yourself. You know, slow your breathing, like people have said. If you, but if you're still hyperventilating, breathe into your hands, something like that. Breathe into your shirt, like you said. Slow it down. Got to get control of yourself, and then you control your passenger. Yep. So, but yeah, that's. I mean, that's a good question. That's what you got to do. So, the symptoms. Okay, I want you to remember some of these symptoms: visual impairment, lightheadedness, dizziness, tingling sensations. Okay, it's kind of similar to something else. All right. You see any of those symptoms up here? <coughs> what is hypoxia? Not enough oxygen. Say it. Not enough oxygen? Yep. Um, why is hypoxia so dangerous? Because you're not going to really realize the onset of it. Well, Sounds like something else we just talked about. Alcohol. <laughs> oh, no, we didn't talk about that yet, did we? No, I mean, I don't know. Let's go back to the I'm safe. What did we talk about on the I'm safe that was so hard to identify ourselves? Stress. Stress. Stress, when you read the AIM, or I'm sorry, when you read the pilot handbook, Aaron Ockermoz, it talks about stress as being a really bad thing. It calls this the same thing. It, it says that this is what is, um, it's insidious is what it says. Right? It's a really great word. I love it. <laughs> Hypoxia is really dangerous. Really, really, really dangerous because you can't feel it happening. It's so gradual. Um, if we have time at the end here, I'm gonna I'll pull up a video of um, a military test. Uh, they had a couple pilots in the hyperbaric chamber, and they were in the altitude chamber, and they had one guy go hypoxic, and they're holding up cards for him to read, and do it. And it and it goes away quick too. All right, so cyanosis. What's that? Okay. What's the? Does anybody know where the first thing that's gonna cyanosis will show up at? Yeah, the little whites of your fingernails. That will show first. Okay. So if you have a say down the road, you guys become CFIs, you're flying with passengers, and you're flying at altitude. When can you become susceptible? When are you susceptible to hypoxia? What altitudes? Ten thousand but usually. Yeah. Any altitude. It's possible. Any altitude other than where you're at. If you're just if you are not used to it, you can get hypoxic at three thousand feet easily. Does anybody know what altitude the FAA recommends you use uh, supplemental oxygen at night? When does the what altitude does the FAA recommend supplemental oxygen at night? Twelve thousand. Hmm. Twelve thousand. Eight. Three. 
3,000 feet. Two or three. 3,000 <laughs> feet. At night, why? What's the first thing that's, to be, that's going to be affected by lack of oxygen? Night vision. Your vision in general. Okay? And at night, we already have a lack of vision. Okay? And we're actually going to talk about the eyeball at the very end. My last, second, one of the, the second last slide is the eyeball. We're going to talk about that, okay? Hypoxia is really bad because it can affect you at any altitude. I did a report uh, when I was with my master's. They had <coughs> hypoxic events. Um, Japanese and the Australian Air Force had hypoxic, hypoxic events at 3,000 feet. I messed up. <coughs> by pilots and crew members. It doesn't take much. Physical exertion has a lot to do with it, how hard you're working. So they had load masters on the choppers that were getting it. They also had a pilot, smoker, not the greatest of shape. <laughs> and we're all susceptible to it at different levels at different days, and no one no one person's the same. Okay? So hypoxia is really, really bad. Keep an eye out for your passengers. Fingernails are really good. Lips, obviously. Hands in general, because that's what you're gonna see on the yoke or near them. Or near like first thing you'll be able to look at, okay? But how do you identify it in yourself? Because what's one of the problems? And look, there's your visual impairment. Maybe you're experiencing that. But maybe you're hyperventilating. Okay? Here are the different types. Hypoxic, hypemic, hysterotoxic, and stagnant. Somebody give me an example of hypoxic hypoxia. Real world example. Altitude sickness. Who has ever gone hiking in Colorado doing a, trying to do a 14er? Did you feel dizzy? No. No? Well, you probably trained for it, didn't you? I lived at 10,000. Well, there you go. <laughs> you were acclimated. People have to train to go do, uh, well, people have to train to do Denali, right? They, you can get hypoxic doing Denali. It's really up there. Okay? So altitude sickness is... What is altitude sickness dealing with? Hypoxic hypoxia is dealing with what? Pressures. There's a lack of pressure. Not enough oxygen molecules at that altitude. Percentage never changes, does it? But the molecules available do. Hypemic hypoxia. Somebody give me an example of hypemic hypoxia. Now, I don't look it up. Getting replaced by something else. Carbon monoxide poisoning is hypemic hypoxia. What is carbon? What happens with carbon monoxide poisoning? Nothing, nothing, nothing. It blocks out the oxygen uptake. The CO, carbon, the carbon monoxide molecule adheres better to the blood than oxygen does. It replaces it. Makes it in more. If your blood cannot absorb the oxygen and carry it, it's absorbing the CO instead. So now you're not getting oxygen to where it needs to go. Okay. So still, it's a lack of oxygen because the oxygen is being replaced by something else. Okay. So hypemic hypoxia. If you're car if you have carbon monoxide poisoning, you are hypoxic. How about histotoxic hypoxia. Think of histotoxic hypoxia for a second, okay? Headache, impaired judgment, visual impairment, drowsiness, lightheadedness and dizziness, euphoria. What makes you feel that way? Drugs. And? Alcohol. alcohol. Drugs and alcohol. If you're drunk, you're hypoxic. It blocks the brain's receptor. You're not able to absorb the oxygen into your brain. Other things take its place. That's histotoxic hypoxia. Blocks the brain from being able to absorb the oxygen. And stagnant hypoxia. I want real world, not, a, not something that you can experience at the airplane, okay? For stagnant hypoxia. Anybody can experience this. Not anybody. I want to let something that we have all in this room in 
experienced. Everyone in this room has experienced this. Standing up. There's no ventilation. Nope. Has nothing to do with ventilation. No. No. Working yourself. Nope. What? You guys have never had your foot fall asleep on you? <sighs> Cutting off the blood flow to something is stagnant hypoxia. Yeah. What do you feel? Tingling. Tingling. Numbness. There's no blood flow. There's no oxygen getting to the tissue. That is stagnant hypoxia. G-lock is what most people say when they talk about airplanes. You know, you pull in heavy Gs, blood flows down, right? That's why pilots wear G-suits. G-suits only wrap around your legs and your waist, forcing blood up. Believe me, I know. I felt it. It was uncomfortable. Um, but that's, yeah, it just forces blood up. So keeps the blood, the oxygenated blood where it needs to be. I was flying back to Hawaii and both my feet went numb. I had like a sinus thing from the allergies. I almost panicked just because I had all the blood and my legs were numb. I was like, oh my God, I'm going to die. <laughs> well, what altitude do you think that airplane pressurized to? We were flying higher than usual because of how turbulent it was. So it doesn't like, matter. The plane still pressurized to the same area, uh, 8 to 10,000 feet. So you're above what you're used to. And then, of course, you drank, so you made it worse. <laughs> I was uh, flying for like three days after I landed. Up. Even flying in an airliner, you are still susceptible to the sinus issues because you're flying at a pressure you're not used to. It's still, you are eight to 10,000 feet. So, unless you're on the 787, the Dreamliner is pressurized at 6,000 feet for passenger comfort. Well, when the pilots don't stall it into the ground, it's still in the tank. All right. Good on that. Yes, sir. What are we going to do about hypoxia? What is the fix for hypoxia? Just huh? Just no. <laughs> you don't want to keep breathing in the least. I mean, you can breathe all you want. You just don't want to get the oxygen. Lower altitude. Or lower the altitude. Yep. Lower the altitude or supplemental oxygen is huge. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's different forms you can get. Cannulas are pretty popular. It's the one that goes in the nose. Um, those only work to about. I think 20,000 feet. Above that, you have to have the mask. All right. Carbon monoxide poisoning. We already talked about that. What are the symptoms? It's the same as hypoxia because it is hypoxia. All right. Let's talk about some of the illusions in flight. Okay. And how this affects you. What are the leans? No. Kind of, yeah. All most of these, all these ones here, uh, these ones here are dealing with a lack of vision. Okay, you feel the plane do something, but you are in zero. Say you're in instrument conditions, and now you are you feel like the plane's doing something that it's really not doing. So, like Coriolis illusion, you feel like the plane is rotating on you because you hold back or you accelerated. Now it feels like you're tumbling backwards. Uh, graveyard spiral, you get into a constant rate turn and you roll out of it. Or if, and if you do it too quickly, you might feel like you're turning the other way. So you overcorrect to go back to straight and level, except you're in a slight bank. Well, what happens in a bank? If you don't add sack pressure, so you're losing your horizontal component of lift, now you're in a gradual descent. And graveyard spiral it takes you all the way down to the scene of the crash. About false horizons. Anybody know what false horizons is? This is a visual illusion at night. What do we have over here that all the rich people live on? Hillside. Do you think the lights go like this on it at night? <laughs> And if you're flying and it's very dark out and you see the lights going like this, like, oh crap, I'm not straight at the horizon. <laughs> now you are in trouble because you were straight at the horizon, you are following a false horizon, and now you're going to go to the ground. Autokinesis. I, I've experienced this several times. I mean, not even a flight. It's weird. If you look at a bright light at night for too long, what happens to that light? It starts moving on you. 
autokinesis. It's not actually doing it. So brain tricking our eyes. You have to think of that, okay? So what's the danger with autokinesis? It turns your... Uh... Well, if you see this bright light and it starts moving on you, what do you think it is? An airplane. Could be. Well, it probably something on the ground. But if it's moving, <clears throat> I've done it before. I was like, crap, and I moved the plane. Oh, wait, an idiot. It's bright light. But if you do that in low visibility conditions and you get into a cloud or something like that, now you're running into one of these other ones. You can get these are things that can build on each other very bad. You wear things at night. What's another problem with night in regards to this? Not everything. At night, if you focus on something, what happens to it? Disappears. Why? What do you guys know about the human eyeball? The rods, and rods and cones. What is the purpose of the rods? I don't know. What's the purpose of the rods? So yeah, see movement, right? Mm. Rods are Illumination. Rods are color. Cones are color. Rods. Illumination. Are they light? Do you see color with rods? Not really. It's more black and white. What are the rods really good at? Huh? No. Contrast. No. Focusing. Say again. Focusing. No. Nope. Illumination. Color. Low light. Low light conditions. They pick up light really. They're very sensitive to light. They're not active very much in the daytime. <clears throat> what are you using rods or cones to see peripheral? Rods. They're more focused around the sides. They're really good at seeing, picking up deep, uh, like small things that are harder to like. Like I said, it's more it's the low light stuff. They're not they're not used for focus. They see the peripheral things. The cones are what we use. They give us really great details. They see color, and they're very good at detail. That's what we use for vision. That's when we look at something, we see it. Now, do we have a blind spot that with uh, in the daytime as well? Yeah. Where? Huh? Yeah, like right in the center. Mm, actually, it's depending on which eye it is, it's either right here or over here. So if you left eye blind spot you over here, right eye blind spot's over here. Why? Is there a spot on the back of our eyes that doesn't have any rods or cones? Yeah. Yeah, where? So for the optic nerve. The optic nerve. Where that attaches, there's nothing, there's nothing there. So if you look at something that's in that spot where that you would be using that portion of your eyeball, you can't see anything. And there are tests you can do if you want to look them up online to just try it and find it out and see it. It's legit. It's crazy. But it, things disappear. It is a blind spot because there are no sensory uh, sensors there to pick it up. Okay. But understanding blind spots is real important because at night. Um, we are really focusing on the rods, okay? That's all we've got to use. So if you're flying around at night and you're having a hard time identifying something, what do you do? Look up or right next to it, yeah, just off center a little bit and it, it will show up, okay? What's another problem with the rods? So how long does it take to get your night vision? Three minutes? No. Like 30, 30 minutes. Uh, and I use, does anybody know what the chemical is that are the rods used for night vision? Nice. You just pass the class. You don't have to take the final. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, rhodopsin. Light destroys rhodopsin. That's why it takes so long for th up to 30 minutes to reacclimate your eyes. It has to resaturate the rods. Okay. Here's your optic nerve blind spot. It is not straight back. It's slightly down on the back of our eye. Okay? So the eye, the limitations of the eye are really important. What's another big limitation of the human eyeball in regard to traffic identification? Sorry. 
What are two things that activate the eye? Really quick, like it's just snap to it. Light and motion. Okay. What is the problem with the motion aspect of it in aviation? You can't see in what we're here. What are they on right now? Collision course. Collision course. There's no relative movement in each other's windscreens of the other aircraft. You are on a collision course with somebody else. You will not. There will be no motion. So the image, the the other aircraft will get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger as you get closer, but it's very gradual. You won't see it. You are blind to the other airplane. And we won't pick them up. You guys heard me tell you the story about near Miss I in Colorado, right? And the guy talked to me afterwards. He's like, I have no idea why I couldn't see. You. I knew why. No relative motion. We're on a collision course. We're going to hit each other. And at that point, yes, I was very big in his windscreen, but it's too late. He, At that point, he was, when you get to that point, he was already looking at where he was going next. He was getting ready to turn. He was turning underneath me. It's too late. Why didn't he, was there any light for him to see? Strobes on my wingtips. It's daytime in Colorado. It's super bright. So, Traffic out in the practice area. You know, understand the limitation of the human eyeball. What do you do if you are given a traffic alert? What's the best thing to do? Reacting to the right wing. Maybe descend, maybe not. Climb or descend. Do something. Change your aspect angle to that other aircraft. Um, and sometimes it's hard. I was told today that I had traffic at my 11 o'clock, so I immediately turned to the east. And then ATC came over and said, turn westbound. Because they were turning that way, what we did was we turned towards each other again. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> Which way are you supposed to go to avoid another aircraft? Off to the right. To the right. I was on a north heading. I turned to the east. Which way did I turn? Right. Which way did they turn? Right. They turned left. So yeah, it happens. I was a passenger a few years ago and almost had a head on. Not fun, is it? Did you see him? No. That's until the last moment, and we passed wingtip to wingtip. Scared the shit out of us. I had that happen not too long ago, also. Flying along, and all of a sudden, it's like, holy crap, there is somebody right there. And I I took the plane immediately, power, turned the airplane, and went into a steep dive to get the hell away from the other airplane. We weren't nearly that close. We weren't that close. But yesterday, I was coming back with another student, and I was, we were climbing up a little bit. And then ATC called up and said, traffic at your 2 o'clock, altitude unknown. That's always my favorite. I love it when they say altitude. <laughs> <laughs> and I, immediately, the place I always end up looking is low, because usually they're puddle, you know, they're little cubs or things like that that don't have altitude encoders. And so they're just they're flying low. The little cubs and all the other the lake of traffic, they love staying about five, 600 feet above the ground. And yeah, I look over, and there's a red airplane climbing up right at me. Wasn't again not that close. I mean, I've had really close. It wasn't that close, but it surprised me. I was like, oh shit. Turn the plane, climbing away. Um, and I had it not so long ago, and this is where it can get you. The same type of call, you know, traffic three or two o'clock, altitude unknown. Guess where they were at this time? 2,500. Yeah, they were high. And where do we like to fly? I prefer two to five, 20, 2,000 to 2,500. That's a nice range to do maneuvers in. So they're right where I wanted to be. And I was not expecting that. I was expecting low. So, um, but like with today's occurrence, you know, you can only do so much. You know, if you don't have the traffic and you're told to turn immediately and you turn and it's the wrong way, whoops. Okay, so limitation of the human eye. We are attracted to movement and light. On a collision course, there is no relative movement. As far as the other stuff, talking about the uh, sensations, what are these? Mm -hmm. Part of it, yeah. What are they? I call them gyros. <laughs> Basically, gyros, right? They sense movement. How many do we have? 
in each year? Three. They sense the three different planes of rotation. Lateral, longitudinal, and rotation. Okay? There's little hairs in there, the cupolas uh, or whatever the hell it is. Fluid moves through it. Okay? That's how it senses motion. What is the problem when you get into a constant turn? Eventually, the fluid is going to reach the same speed as... It stops the... moving. It stabilizes. If you're on a constant turn, this is where the Grand Rift file comes in. You change it again. Now it starts the fluid moving again, even though you're going back to a steady state. Okay? This is, uh, this is the problem. It's in our inner ear, and it's just a fluid moving around and activating these little hairs in there. Okay? So... This is what's causing those illusions. And who's been, who's ever been on an airplane or even in a car? You're sitting there in a car at a stoplight and the car next to you starts rolling backwards. <laughs> and you think you're going forward. Yeah, you totally think you're going forward, don't you? Yep. Or you're sitting there at the gate in an airplane and the plane next to you is get, starts moving backwards. Mm -hmm. So if you're like, you're going forward, <laughs> you're not moving, but your eyes see something and it tricks everything. Can even trick this, okay, and vice versa. So illusions are pretty big. You know, we can the eyes can trick the brain. This is our primary sensor for motion is our eyeballs. If it's not coordinated with what our ears are feeling, then we really get disoriented. Who has ever experienced special disorientation? How? Uh, they're um, driving. Driving? Mm -hmm. Yep. How about you. Ships. On ships, yeah. I've experienced it driving and in the airplane. I'll tell you, in the airplane, it's scary. You're going to have to do flight where you're wearing a you know, limiting device. It's called the foggles or the hood. Okay, you put it on, and all you can see are your displays. And so you have no outside reference. Who in here has ever had the opportunity to do that? Out of you guys that have flown? How hard is it sometimes? Well, initially, it was really difficult. And also... Motion sickness. Yes. And, a to do that. and that's another issue with this is the motion sickness. Yeah, I was flying at night one time during my private training. I needed more night and instrument flying. So I figured, you know, night would be the best time to do instrument because I like night flying. And we were doing a flight down on the way to Homer and just got bumped a little bit by some turbulence. Nothing big. It wasn't any big deal, but it threw me off. And I really felt like we were tumbling over backwards. And it took everything I had to not force the nose down because I really thought we were, I, th I thought we were tumbling over. And it should have been a clue to me that we weren't because my flight instructor didn't say a thing. And I'm sitting the whole time panicking, feeling like the plane is doing that. And I'm looking at my gauges and I'm trying to register what's going on. And all that we really were in was a very slight right hand descending turn, really slight. But I felt like I was doing the exact opposite, tumbling over backwards. That lasted for probably 20 seconds before it finally was able to overcome it. And everything just kind of went back to the normal. It was the scare, one of the scariest things I've ever experienced in the airplane. And I have flown into actual before where I'm flying along, everything's, I'm fat, dumb, and happy thinking I'm good. And I look over like, oh, holy crap, we're in a 30 degree bank. And I'm 20 degrees off course now. <clears throat> Whoopsie, forgot my scan. It's very easy. And it felt straight. I felt like I was flying straight normal. So it doesn't take much, okay? All right. Aeronautical decision making. The last little bit we're going to cover, okay? Big deal. The FAA is really, really, really big into this, okay? There are some hazardous attitudes. Anti authority, all right? Don't tell me what to do. Why? Why is that so bad? Because that makes you like not teach people. Kinda, yeah. Yeah, people do have authority over you, whether you like it or not. Yeah, but this is more. What are you talking about when it says, "Don't tell me what to do"? What are they like the anti-authority? What are we talking about? I guess I'm like wanting to be competitive, like, "Well, I'm not going to do what you said because I don't want to do what you said, even though it's wrong." Well, the end of those are down here. It says, "Follow the rules." They're usually right. What rules are we talking about? Arms. The regs, yeah, the regs. Why do we want to follow the regs? They're written in blood. It says if you don't, then you can't trust me. They are written in blood, okay? They're there because people have died. 
So if someone else has done it, you think that maybe you might? Okay. Impulsivity. Do it quickly. Like go, 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 go. When do you think you might be most susceptible to this as student pilots? Landing. Nope. When you think something's wrong? This is like, hey, we trying to get the flight done. These are usually pre-flight hat attitudes. <laughs> like, you know, the regs, well, the weather's not that bad. I'm going to go. You can't tell me what to do. I mean, I'll be all right. Type of stuff. Okay, this is the pre-flight stuff that we want to go watching out for. Uh, and it can be in-flight too, but a lot of times do it quickly. Like, I can't tell you how many times I've heard a student say, well, I know the weather's kind of bad, but I've got to get the solo done because my check ride's next week. You won't get a check ride from the Well, there's <laughs> kind of go -itis that yeah. blends into that. It yep. kills more people. Than and ride. that's, I would say that it is impulsivity. Who, there's a really famous person that was, that died because of impulsivity and macho. You guys know who that is? John Denver? No, John Denver died for other reasons. Yeah. Uh, no, Julia really Earhart. Kennedy Jr. She so was Kennedy Jr. Kennedy Jr. Just took a little too much on. He needed to go. He was running late. Got to go. Got to go. Got to go. And he could do it. His. Do you guys know that his flight instructor offered to go with him, and he turned him down? Hmm. Wow. Flying at night over the water, moonless night. Perfect. That is pretty much instrument conditions there. There's no horizon. You can't see outside and know what is going on. And he was not instrument rated. Mm -hmm. He was still legal to go because he's VFR, he's a visual flight rules. There was no IMC to deal with. But he flew into a situation that is basically instrument. That's one of those, I can do it. Well, that's a case also. Apparently, he had uh, some instrument training, but wasn't IFR. The we all, was, every pilot, private pilot student gets instrument rate training. Have to, in case was, you get a time. He was working for He it. was working on it, but he wasn't there yet. Right, right. And his instructor offered to go, knowing that he wasn't ready. He had also was flying an unfamiliar airplane he just purchased. Mm -hmm. Oh. So the stress levels were eight. You were ratcheting up the stress levels, okay? We're going to talk about risk it here in a second. Okay. Impulsivity, do it quickly. Well, not so fast thing first, okay? You, do you have to get this flight done? No. No. Yes, the check ride's next week. It's going to suck to bump it out. Bump it out. Better to be on the ground wishing you were in the air than to be in the air wishing <laughs> you were on the ground. Okay? All right. Macho, I can do it. Or I'm sorry, vulnerability. It won't happen to me. I can do it. This is a guy thing. You know, we always think we're invulnerable, especially younger guys. They're idiots. We're all idiots. <laughs> <laughs> we think we're invincible. I learned at 23 that I was not invincible when I threw my back out. Well, I'm not Superman, apparently. All right? It can happen to you. It has happened to people better than you. So it definitely can happen to you, okay? Macho, I can do it. No, it can happen to you. And resignation. All right? This one's a little tougher. Say you're on the airplane and something bad happens, like you lose the engine. What do you do? All over now, right? <laughs> you glide down. And the plane the does glide to a point, you know. If it's a slow descent, you can do things. If you lose a wing, what do you do? Do you just accept it and then it's all over? I'm not going down without a fight. I'll do everything and anything I can to try to figure out how to fly a wingless airplane. <laughs> <laughs> you know. You're not helpless. There are things you can do to make a difference. This happens. Like, this is a tough one because you know we're always worried about bad things happening in the planet or something happening because of our attitude. But this is a situation where something bad happened outside of your control and you just resign yourself to your fate. And then we don't want to do that. Yes, ma'am. I was just gonna say there was this flight. I, I don't remember what it was, but the whole or not the whole like one fourth of the roof came off and they still yeah. landed the plane. And yeah, that was, was um, great fatality. Flight. That was the Aloha Airlines yeah. flight. Yeah. It, had a rapid depressurization, blew the roof off. Yeah. Did they accept their fate? No. What's that? Well, another example. What it was one of the Gemini missions where the astronauts weren't even supposed to be controlling the capsule, completely malfunction. They ended up taking it in on an artificial horizon. They carved into the fucking plexiglass. Wasn't that um? Was it first man on the moon? I was an Armstrong. I think. Sure. It might have been, I think it was Armstrong. Sure. Either way, how about another one? Yeah. You lose engines. 
and all hydraulic power. I'm sorry, you lost, you're flying a 767 and you just lost all your engine. You ran out of fuel. You have no engines. How do you land a 767 when you don't have hydraulic power? You have very limited hydraulic, just enough to get the gear out, but you don't have flaps. You don't have anything else. What do you do? You land on a drag racing strip. How do you get the airplane down? A forward slip. Yeah, what's the problem? A forward slip. Wait, what is it? You use the airplane as drag to help to send you rather than flaps because he couldn't deploy his flaps. He had not, he didn't have enough hydraulic pressure to deploy flaps. There are always things you can do. This was the Gimli glider. So, two summers ago, there was a guy uh, off the Lake Hood on floats. Who had an engine outage and he was flying. He flew it all the way to the ground in a residential neighborhood, landed it in the street in a residential neighborhood just yep. north of Lakewood Strip. I'll tell you what, and, and it was just kind of debris all through the neighborhood and he missed everybody. I mean, it was <laughs> amazing, but he flew it all the way to the ground. No engine. Yeah, I mean, with floats on. Think about this, guys, when you start flying here. What if you lose an engine just off the departure end of 2-5? Join the cars. All right, no. You're not making the port, dude. No. At 200 feet? No. A graveyard? <laughs> you will, it will be a graveyard. <laughs> there are not a lot of good options, okay? The streets are always congested for the most part. There's lights and power lines, um, power lines everywhere. Buildings everywhere else. Should do the best. Parking yeah. lots with cars. Make it across the street to Elmendorf, maybe. At no. 200 feet? No. Maybe. No. no. You're not going to. No. You won't even be able to make the turn right. back to. I was thinking multi-engine. We said it was an engine. So. Oh. Well, he. Yeah. The engine. The engine. <laughs> okay. Another thing that kills right. a lot of people is that they think they can make it back. Yes. Yep. But you cannot turn back. The impossible turn. Yep. When I give my pre-flight briefing, it's. If we expense an engine failure or abnormality on the takeoff roll, we're going to immediately close the throttle, stop straight ahead, braking as required. Mm -hmm. If there's not enough runway remaining, fuel selector off or shut up valve off, mixture cut off, ignition off, battery off. We're going to stop straight ahead and just avoid obstacles. I'm cutting the fuel and the electrical so there's no post crash fire. Hopefully, if I expense an engine failure or an abnormality after takeoff, I'm landing on the remaining runway at 30 degrees of center line. I will not attempt a 180 degree turn. If there's not enough runway remaining, I'm going to proceed straight ahead to the safest location I can find. Fuel selector or shut up valve out, makes your cutoff, ignition off, battery stays on for flaps, make a radio call if I have time. Once the line is assured, battery off, doors open, land as slow as you can. Pray you don't kill anybody. That's about all we can do. Okay? No 180 degree turn. My briefing is not for when I'm at pattern altitude. Who cares? I will make a runway from the pattern, I guarantee it. I know how to do a power off 180, I had to do it for my checker. I demonstrated for all my students, every uh, 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 every student gets that demonstration. And those students also have to do it themselves. I want all my private to do the power off 180. My commercial ones don't have a choice. It's required for the checker. It's not the pattern altitude that's the issue. It's lower. And you don't have the time to make the decision if you have time to make it a turn to the back of the runway. Okay? So it's all about this, risk management. Okay? So, this goes back to hazard statutes. Accept no unnecessary risk. This is straight out of the pilot handbook aeronautical knowledge. The FAA says, accept no unnecessary risk, okay? You make risk bad decisions at the appropriate level. What level is that? Huh? None. Sorry? None. What? Is that level I said no, no. Risk decisions are made at the appropriate level. Well, what level are we talking about? Student pilot's very different from a super experienced older pilot. Absolutely. Who makes the decisions at what is the appropriate level then for making the decisions when it comes to a student pilot? The instructor is the appropriate level. Don't go to the chief pilot and say, hey, should I do this? No. The instructor makes that call. PSC authority. Who has the authority in the airplane? Do you call ATC and say, hey, uh, this is my situation. Do I? What do I do? <laughs> no, that's our call. Okay, that's the appropriate level. Certain decisions are made for us, like here, we've got operating um, minimums. Like if it's reported uh, moderate turbulence, we don't get to go. If it's forecasted severe, we don't get to go. You can go fly with me at Angel, I'll be in the air. 
Um, <laughs> there are certain things that are made for us, okay? Accept risk when benefits outweigh the costs. What are is it a risk to go fly an airplane? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh. What's the benefit to go flying an airplane? What what so what is so the cost is potentially your life, right? Yeah. There's other things too. I mean, obviously financial, but what are the benefits of going flying? Satisfaction. It's amazing. Yeah. It's what I want to do. Apparently, it's what you all want to do because you're in this class. Okay. In that case, we already are accepting some level of risk, and because it outweighs the costs that we of us doing what we love. All right. Now, what about on a super turbulent day when you are a very low time pilot that's not very confident in their abilities? No, probably not then. How about when the west winds are gusting 30 knots at a 45 degree angle to the runway? Again, probably not. Okay. And then implement risk management and planning at all levels. Well, this is just determining for each flight and each portion of your what's happening. How about you're on the practice area and you decide, you know what, things are turning nasty. We're going to terminate. We're going to head back now. Okay. Just at all levels of your flight planning. Okay. What's single pilot resource management? What's crew? Okay, by yourself in the plane. Obviously, single pilot, right? How's that different from crew resource management? I'm sorry? There's more people think about like the problems. Let's talk about the crew environment. You are flying for Alaska Airlines on a 737. You're the captain. Who is your crew? Captain, FO, flight attendant, dispatcher. Who else? Chief pilot. You're kind of on the plane, so it's the. So as captain, you have your first officer, you have the flight attendants. Is that it? Is that your crew? Well, flight passengers. They're still people. Absolutely. Might have some experience. How about United 237? Anybody know that one? The one that crashed in Sioux City, Iowa? DC-10 had a number two engine fail that took out all three hydraulic systems. Who was in the back of the plane as a passenger? Not a mechanic. <laughs> One of the most experienced pilots for United as a DC-10 check airman. It's a passenger on their plane. <laughs> Guess who helped him out? Denny Fitch. That's his name. Everyone's seen the aircraft, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just don't ask him. He's got a drinking problem. <laughs> um, <laughs> Surely you can't be serious. Stop calling your channel. systems and the number two to sell. What's that? Can we bring up the all three hydraulic systems and the number two to sell? Oh, it would never happen. It would never happen. All right. So crew resource management is everybody in the cockpit with you, everybody in the airplane with you. Okay. You are a crew. You will rely on your passengers if something happens and you need help with. Do you, don't passengers get briefed on what to do in case of an emergency if they're in the exit rows? Mm -hmm. They are part of the crew. Okay. But single pilot resource management is a little different. What are the resources you have as a single pilot? Kind of, you were listing off some of them for the crew. And, as, and that's true also. Dispatcher. You've got mechanics on the ground. You've got ATC. You, there's so many resources at your fingertips. Other pilots in the air. I've had ATC call me up and ask me, hey, can you monitor 121.5? We're having an issue. Um, we're looking for a locator. I've also had to, relay, I've had to relay communications to another airplane for them to get them back on a proper frequency because they were outside and ATC couldn't communicate with them anymore. Requesting observation if gear is down. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And how do we help improve our aeronautical decision making? What is a skill that we can develop or a tool that we can use? <laughs> yeah. Create your own scenarios. What would you do in this? That's the what if game, okay? All right. This is the last thing we're going to talk about. This is part of aeronautical decision making. This is the risk assessment matrix, okay? Has anybody ever seen this before? Yeah. How does this work? You lie until you're low. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, what did, we, what did I say the FAA says about risk? No, no unnecessary risk. Except no unnecessary risk. Let's talk about a scenario real fast, okay? <clears throat> Likelihood. 
is at the top here. How likely is this to occur? And the consequence for the severity, fatal, major, minor, and negligible, okay? Likely, very likely, likely, unlikely, highly unlikely, okay? So all you do is you pick the severity, go across until you hit the likelihood of it, and then that is your risk associated with it, okay? Who determines what the likelihood and the severity of these, each of the different scenarios that we're discussing? You You do, you have your own. So let's do one. How about flying out in the practice area today, okay? <laughs> what is the likelihood of a mid-air collision in the practice area on a day like today? Likely. Medium to high. Like everyone's flying there. I would say it's unlikely. I would say it's unlikely. It's unlikely. Who's wrong? No one. Nobody. No. Yeah. This is your own, okay? So we've got an unlikely. All right. What is the severity of a midair collision? Fatality. Guess what? Even unlikely, you're still looking at a high. Does that mean you don't go fly? No. No, because this is the cost, okay? But what's the benefit? It is a fantastic day to fly. Really great day to teach sight picture and for the, the student pilot to learn how to control the airplane without anything really bumping them around. I flew hands-free most of the time today. I had the plane trimmed down, maintaining altitude, and I didn't have to hardly touch any flight controls. There was no turbulence. The only time I had to touch high flight controls to avoid other airplanes. Beautiful day to fly. It was amazing. So the benefits were really high. Do the benefits outweigh the cost? Obviously, I flew. So, yeah. Okay. How about somebody? So, let's do a different one. Um, how about flying in severe turbulence? All right. What is the likelihood of structural damage in severe turbulence? If you're flying at your maneuvering speed, it should be okay. But what is the severity of structural damage? So we're in here, right? But we're down into the medium range, okay. Even if it's fatal, this is why we have maneuvering speed, though. Okay, knowing this is helping with your decision making. Should we not go? I flew in it. It sucks. Is not fun. So the cost isn't super high, is it? It's on the medium range. But what are the benefits to it? And maybe some training, maybe teaching the student how to maneuver, like deal with severe turbulence. Can that training be done in other ways? Say, like maybe just in moderate turbulence. Yang, Renee. Yeah. Who makes the call? Yeah. Okay, you see how the risk management and the decision making works. That's we do this without even thinking about it. I mean, you drive your car, there are a lot of idiots on the road. <laughs> no, you're already accepting the risk that somebody's gonna sideswipe you. Now you start playing with your phone and things are getting a little higher and a little dicey. Yeah, you're right. But we're doing this on a regular basis every single day. I'm just like it's been provided to us, and I'm pointing it out to you that this is how you do it. Okay. It's part of aeronautical decision making. Do that and when you're deciding whether or not to go. This helps using a, a model like this helps you not fall into the trap of those hazardous attitudes. Okay. Questions? Yes, ma'am. You never got to talk about mental illnesses. Mental illness. Right. Oh, so it was more about the stress. All right. So, what mental illness? I, I totally like spaced it now. Totally anxiety, anxiety, stress, bipolar. Well, bipolars. I heard that's about the bipolar. Say again. Uh, are you not allowed to fly with bipolarism? I have no idea. There's I would. Well, you're you're not not sure not you're not sure. Not I would imagine so. not. So. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> what is it just to put your medicines? Yes. There's also other things to do. You can go through the even if the AME won't provide you like won't grant you a medical. That's not the end. You still go talk. What's that? No, you talk to the federal air surgeon. Oh, that's right. The federal air surgeon is who you're going to go to. There is 
There's another one, I can't remember what's called, what, what else you can look for, um, but you can get what's called a SOTA, a Statement of Demonstrated Ability. Once you get a SOTA, you don't deal with it again. Uh, there's other ones you have to do uh, every couple of years that they'll verify. This one dude on Merrill with one eyeball. Yeah, I, I had a student, she was blind in one eye, and she is getting to do her flight with, she has to go out and do a flight with a, a surgeon, not the federal or surgeon, but one of the federal ones below, the, like the designated one. And uh, if she yeah. can do the flight, and prove that she's safe to fly an airplane, she'll get a soda. And she will never have to deal with that again. Every time her medical comes up, she goes in, provides the soda. As long as she everything else is okay, she's good to go. Yeah. Um, color blindness. Another one. Okay. So yeah, there are ways. Now, mental illness, it depends. And what it is like, emotion and stress can really mean well, yeah. I know like a female pilot that had postpartum depression yeah. and she was able to fly like a year after. She, so, so if it was diagnosed, she had to prove there was no was. longer an issue. Yeah. And that's all it is. So like if you have like adjustment anxiety, cause I, I heard that's like such a small thing, but it's still like something yeah. that can hold you back. Blood pressure is a big thing to the FAA. They yeah. don't play with blood, blood pressure. Mm -hmm. It's, um, yeah, they, the best thing to do, the best rule of thumb with anything like that is if you have a medical concern, talk to Amy about it. Don't hide it from them. Okay, share with them. Yes, it may cause you some problems getting your medical. But in the long run, it's better. Because if they find out about it down the road, you will probably lose your medical and never be able to get it back. And then you're not flying. So, um, Did you go over advanced medications? We talk about medications in general. Like, I'm not going to go into the banned ones, but know that over the counters are the most dangerous ones because you might think they're okay and they're really not. Google it. All right, there are a lot. There's a lot of good information. You Google medications and FAA, and usually if you add FAA to anything, it's going to take you to an FAA site that will provide you information. The best person to talk to though is your AME, your Air Med or Aviation Medical. Um, Examiner. What's the FAA's uh, stance on marijuana? I don't know. That's the rule. Same stance as alcohol. No. But that one's zero tolerance. Right? It's a federal thing. You're talking about the Federal Aviation Air Administration. Federally, it's illegal. You can't do that. Um, do they test for it, though? Yeah. Do you get it? The company will. FAA does not. Airlines not testing for it. Airlines will. The FAA is not testing for it. Okay. Not worth it. So. Fly. Yeah. But if something happens. As far as. If you were. If something happens and then they'll test you for anything. Right. Like if oh yeah. Happens, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. If you get into an accident. And if you're under. Like, they're drawing blood. Yeah. yeah, and then you are now the probable cause of the accident. They're not going to say it's your fault. It's always they are looking for the cause, the probable cause, and associated causes because they want to try to prevent things in the future. They don't. The NTSB does not look to place blame, regardless of what you see in the news. They're not looking for blame. Moving yeah. lies. The insurance company. The insurance company definitely is. So, if you hurt somebody and you are listed as a probable cause, there's a dollar value. Any other questions, guys? Yeah. We get to get back into stuff that I don't like as much.